It is almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. Here are the top stories. Asia stocks follow cautious trading on Wall Street as investors await U.S. inflation data, which could influence the Fed's next move. Bank of Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda sees the Japanese economy recovering slowly. A majority of BOJ watches expect a hike to come in April. And we look ahead to India's latest inflation program print due later today. We'll hear from the Union Bank of India very shortly. Well, in the markets, it is trepidation. Investors sitting on the sidelines, sitting on their hands, awaiting for that crucial CPI print. Remember that Powell said he just needs a little bit more convincing that uh, CPI inflation is headed towards 2 percent. Investors looking for more clues on whether or not that recent uptick in U.S. consumer prices was a blip. Take a look where we are in terms of the MSCI asia Pack index down down three tenths of one percent, and in terms of uh, the Nikkei 225, it is extending its slump on the back of a stronger yen. Uh, up for a six-day expectations, the BOJ may exit negative rates perhaps in March, especially on the back of what it did not do yesterday. It did not intervene when the topic slumped more than 2%. Traditionally, it's jumped in to uh, prop up the market at about 2%. CSI 300 index currently in negative territory. It is down about two-tenths of 1%. It is about China and that lackluster performance of a property, Vanka, front and center, uh, causing uh, a lot of uh, trepidation as well as concerns in the property market yet again. We have Moody's downgrading it to junk. In terms of the Chinese yuan trading at 718.47 right now, and the yen, of course, is the one we're tracking at this point in time. It continues to rally. It's outdone every G10 currency this month alone, and some say the rally is at a measured pace. Well, taking a look where we are in terms of U.S. futures as we count down to the CPI print uh, in the U.S a crucial data that we're uh, awaiting. U.S. futures, treasuries, in fact, not doing very much. Little change. S&P futures are currently up by three-tenths of one percent. Dow Jones futures also in the positive ever so slightly. So that CPI print front and center. And linked to the economy, here's Jamie Dimon warning that the U.S. recession is not yet off the table. Now, he says the world is pricing in a soft landing at probably 70 to 80 percent. He says, I think the chance of a soft landing in the next year or two is half of that. The worst case would be stagflation. Well, our next guest thinks the risk of a recession is higher than what's been priced in. Let's bring in Omar Slim. He joins us uh, right now. Omar, I mean, why do you think the recession is not off the table, especially when you consider that data so far has been pretty resilient? I think the main issue is related to the sequencing in terms of what the monetary policy would look like. What I mean by that is I think that the Fed will probably err on the side of caution before cutting. And the other thing is that those cuts really, they need to be framed as adjustment cuts. That's not necessarily a start of a cutting cycle. So if we stay for a prolonged period of time at higher uh, rates, policy rates, even if we're seeing some adjustments, and if the Fed is probably delaying the cuts to the second, I said in your show before, I think, when the consensus was that the cuts will start in the second quarter, that probably start in the second half. So if the market keeps pushing that, I think that's going to add to the stress of the economy. And I think what's priced in now is this kind of this immaculate soft landing or no landing, which the market will increasingly challenge or the narrative might slightly change going forward. But why not a soft landing? I mean, if you take a look at the data is suggesting still U.S. exceptionalism, and hence we've seen how the dollar has stayed pretty resilient. Yeah, why not soft landing? It's really related to the fact that there will be damage caused by the higher policy rates. And we're starting to see some softening in terms of the job market, which really was the main driver of the economic strength. And the other reason is that the Fed really needs to see a few prints, not really one or two prints, a few prints where inflation is trending lower. And I think that will delay the cuts. And with it, there will be some economic, some economic damage. I'm not saying that we're going to have an economic crisis. But what I'm saying is that the chances of a recession, even if it's a shallow recession, is higher than what's priced in. 
So far, from what you have seen, do you expect the USD exceptionalism to stay? And what might that impact be on the markets? Can the market withstand a strong dollar? I think that there's a strong case that the U.S. will continue to outperform, yes. Um, and continue to outperform against what or versus what? I think that it will continue to outperform highly likely uh, when compared to Europe. And also, quite frankly, compared to some emerging markets, the most important of which is, of course, China. So that will uh, continue to, we will continue to have a strong U.S. dollar. I think we might take a breather here and there, but really I don't see a strong case for the, for the U.S. to weaken materially. What I think that will do is it will cause some stresses in terms of some of the, particularly some of the more marginal sovereigns. Um, and we're starting to see some of that actually. We're start, we saw some of that in certain emerging markets. I think that there will be uh, some talks about a broader sovereign pressure, even from some of the developed markets, because you know funding, funding at zero percent or negative is different from funding at three or four or five percent. But I think that's a more slow-moving phenomenon. I don't expect it to materialize this year. Okay, so we had Powell saying he just needs a little bit more convincing. The cut is coming this year. It is a matter of when. CPI that's coming out in the U.S. on Tuesday becomes crucial. It, it, it is crucial. And my view is that there's more downside risks than upside risk. And what I mean by downside risk, I think that the market really needs to see the CPI trend lower uh, for, the, for the particularly the Treasury yields rally, to, to rally. Um, I think that the what I think it's also, again, important to frame what Powell is saying correctly. I think they will adjust the policy rate. I don't think it w they will signal a, a, the, the start of a cutting phase. And I think, that's, I think the market will shift its attention or its focus to what the neutral rate is. And if the neutral rate is higher, I think that could cause the Treasury market to wobble or at least to cease to rally. And that has implication in terms of the funding across the world. You said if the neutral rate is higher, the neutral rate is likely to be higher, no? I mean, isn't that a fair assumption? I think it's a fair assumption, but even if you ask the Fed, the neutral rate is a bit of a, you know, an academic exercise. They even say that they don't actually know where it is. Now, if one asks the question, why is the neutral rate higher? What happened over the past few years for it to be higher? I think I, I on a very long-term trajectory, I'm still a believer in the secular stagnation, but in the kind of call it the medium term, I think a case can be made that the neutral rate is higher because of the fact that the job market is relatively resilient. We're seeing some cracks, some weakness here and there, and I think the job market has been in kind of like a low-grade crisis, which was exacerbated by, by the pandemic and by COVID. But I think that there is a strong case to be made that they're higher, so I, I would agree with your assessment, particularly because of the tightness of the job market. So given what you have just said, the assessment you have just made, what do you make of Treasury valuations right now? I don't see, for now, I don't, I think there will, we will require a very um, strong trend in terms of inflation going lower for the Treasuries to continue to go lower or the Treasury yields to continue to go lower more correctly. So in, in a nutshell, to answer your question directly, I feel that there's downside for Treasury prices or upside for Treasury yields from here. Okay, let's take a look at Japan. It is about the yen. Are we looking at a definite yen reversal? No, I don't think so, I, at the risk of being slightly <laughs> anticlimactic. I remember we were having that conversation <laughs> this summer last year, and I, I, I continue to think that the, the, the Bank of Japan will continue to be rather gradual. You know, you hear Governor Ueda mentioned the word slowly, gradual, progressive quite a few times. So I think they will do the mere minimum. Why? For two reasons. One is, and I think that's the most important reason, is I don't think they actually believe that there, Japan has an inflationary problem. So I think they're kind of calibrating from an ultra-accommodative monetary policy to one which is a bit more sustainable but quite accommodative. And I think the other reason is I don't think that they want to risk any financial instability. Uh, so they're really kind of taking their time and they're hoping that, you know, the global macroeconomic, macroeconomic environment will give them some breathing time. Mm. But my view is that it will be a very dovish exit for the Bank of Japan from its current monetary policy. So forget about the yen getting to 130, 135 thereabouts. You're going to take a look at the yen at 147, 45. What are you looking at? I'm, I'm looking at 140 to 150, frankly. 
Uh, I think for it to go to 130, 135, we need a surprise either from the Fed or from the Bank of Japan. It's not my base case scenario. Okay, we got to talk about China. Just when you thought that things are getting better, we've seen the bottom. Here comes Vanka and the downgrading from Moody's. I mean, this is really bad news at a time when foreign investors are just beginning to dip their toes. I think it is. It adds to the, frankly, to the stress, the major stress that this, the distress, frankly, of the, that that, prop, that that segment. Um, I think the the policy support in China, particularly when it comes to the China property segment, will continue to be very timid, very targeted, very selective, very tepid. Um, and what we're seeing is that that's the case even with some developers that have government ownership in them, in, in this case local government, but still it is significant. I don't think a major reversal will happen, frankly, for, the, for that segment. Uh, at best, we see an L-shaped kind of path. Uh, it's not a policy priority. The NPC also kind of highlighted some of the, it was a continu continuation in terms of what they're doing in terms of policy. So our base case scenario is that there are downside economic risk for Chinese growth of the around 5% target. Mm. And we think that certain segments will continue to be challenged. Chief among them will be the China property sector. And also the Yuan. I mean, we have uh, perhaps the likelihood of a Biden and Trump uh, election at the end of the year. And we've seen how in 2018, at the height of tensions between the US and China, we saw the Yuan slump 13%. I mean, do you foresee further weakness in the currency should Trump come back to power? I think that's a very that's a very good question. I think it will be a, um, the sub topic of intense focus for the markets, particularly as we get closer to the U.S. elections, even though it seems that we know what the, what the, what the two contentions are. Um, the short answer to your question is yes, I think there is downside risk for the one, but I think the Chinese policymakers will intervene to smoothen that out. But we don't see any upside for the one at, at this point, quite the contrary. I'll be remiss to not ask you for how your portfolio is looking like. Where should you be putting your money in? How are you deploying your, your funds? Look, I think in the context of Asia, we still like the Asian investment grade bonds, which frankly have been quite tested over the past few years and they have been quite resilient. They have performed some of the major asset class, similar asset classes. Within Asia high yield, we think that there are some idiosyncratic opportunities, but we're still kind of more cautious on, a, on the market from a beta perspective. And we don't think that, uh, you know, the kind of certain rallies and some of the distressed names will continue. And the local currency market will we're, we're, we're continue to be rather cautious. Again, part of the reason is the U.S. dollar strength, which we continue to, we expect to continue to be the case. What's changed in the last 12 months for you? What's been the biggest change in your portfolio? I think what changed over the past few months is one is the duration positioning, the duration management. I think the market, in the call it the fourth quarter of last year, end of October more precisely, there was a bit of an inflection point in terms of the market thinking that the monetary policy has, has peaked. And I think that has been a major change in terms of the, of the market. And I think we, we traded the duration rather actively back then. And I think now we're in a period of, of, of range trading. So duration positioning has, has changed. The other bit is I think that the expectation in terms of, of China uh, have also become much more lucid. Uh, we were relatively cautious, but I think the market kind of gravitated towards that view over the past year or two years. Um, and I think the, we're still fo quite focused on the policy direction and we don't see any major changes there. Great stuff, good insights. Omar Slim, Pine Bridge Investments, he says no reversal in the yen. Well, plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. And uh, China's MPC concluded with little to cheer about in terms of concrete measures to lift the econ economy out of its malaise. And that is 
impacting the commodity space, iron ore in particular, coming off a 7% slump, the deepest plunge since 2022. Disappointment after the MPC failed to revive demand expectations. Also, inventories in China are piling up at the highest level in about a year. Remember that China's construction is pretty lackluster given the clampdown that we've seen on the property sector. Iron ore currently extending its losses by more than 3%. We're seeing uh, losses to for um, we're seeing gains though for aluminum as well as uh, Shanghai crude. Crude currently up by about 1.4 percent. Oil generally steady ahead of that U.S. CPI data, also OPEC's monthly report and U.S. stockpiles. All that may provide direction uh, for prices uh, in the coming days and weeks. Let's delve deeper into commodities. Bloomberg Stephen Stepchinsky joins us now. Talk to us about the outlook in particular for commodities. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a different picture, right? So when you look at iron ore, for example, you, you had that graph just on the screen showing huge inventories in China. We ended MPC without any of the big stimulus that, that commodities have kind of depended on. So when you do look at the iron ore picture, it is pretty bearish. And looking in the future, um, we have more supply coming online, right? So as more supply comes online, um, that's going to add more pressure, not only to prices, but also to China's inventory buildup. So how long does the Chinese government stick with its kind of strict um, policy on, on construction uh, for, for new buildings? And also, will they eventually pull in some sort of uh, stimulus that would increase uh, the demand for iron ore and steel and pull that through? Now, with oil, oil's a different kind of story because, unfortunately, the picture is even more muddled. So I, I, I would say that oil has been sort of um, doing a whole lot of nothing over the last few weeks. We've been in this around low $80 Brent range, and that's because there are a few uh, different kind of countervailing forces. You have the Red Sea problems. You have um, OPEC plus uh, reducing their output, both things that uh, or continuing their cuts, both things that you would think would increase prices. But at the same time, uh, U.S. shale oil has been pretty strong. Uh, demand in China, not as strong as some had hoped. So all these things together have kind of painted a um, sort of neutral picture for, for oil, and that's why it's been sort of treading water, and, and it's expected to do so over the next few weeks. When it comes to iron ore, no sign abating in terms of the pressure on the commodity because we just had Vanka being downgraded by Moody's, for instance, to junk. I mean, how do the markets adjust to the current situation? Well, the good thing is the markets have a lot of experience adjusting because these markets work in cycles. And there was a cycle um, that was supercharged by uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic and then the energy crisis and, and commodity crisis after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. That kind of dual shock of uh, supply glut to uh, you know, supply crunch uh, for a lot of commodities, especially since they couldn't get the commodities out of Russia, had sent prices surging in 2022. And so there was an, a, a large investment in new supply. People were trying to adjust. There was demand destruction. So the market is trying to adjust itself. I think there is one thing that is certain. And when you look at commodities, and I've looked at commodities for about a decade now, when you do have these low price environments or high price environments, the markets tend to adjust on their own. You do see uh, producers ramping back production. You're seeing that in some metal uh, metal industry. Some, some miners are reducing their output um, to help kind of alleviate uh, where we are in this situation. The same thing is likely to happen for oil. If oil prices were to fall, shale drillers will quickly come off. But we're not seeing that quite at the moment. So I think over Overall, you know, you could see a glut period over a few years, but the market will be able to digest that and, and will get back to balance and likely back to some sort of, you know, supply crunch, sending prices higher again. Like you said, a lot of experience in terms of oil, pretty sightline right now ahead of uh, that CPI print out of the U.S. Bloomberg, Stephen Sepchinski, we thank you so much for your insights. Now, China's economic weakness being seen not only in broader demand for raw materials and other commodities, but also among consumers. The middle class are feeling the pin in many areas, even in goods like pianos, with domestic production plunging last year to half of what it was just four years ago. Our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle has more.
The 2010 Chinese movie The Piano in a Factory depicts just how much a piano was an aspirational goal of Chinese households in the early 90s, as a laid-off steel worker builds one by hand to try and keep custody of his daughter through a bitter divorce. Today, piano stores across China look like this, devoid of customers. Once a state is symbol to own, domestic piano production last year plunged to half what it was just four years ago. The central government desperately wants households to spend more to fight entrenched deflation, but it too is tightening its fiscal belt. We will practice frugality and economy and reject extravagance. Without question, the average Chinese middle-class consumer can be a big spender. But we also know that households are feeling the pinch from a slowing economy, exacerbated by falling home prices and a stock market rout. Now, after the Mao Zedong era social safety net was dismantled, Chinese households also became big savers. So right now, with the economy suffering, they're sort of hitting the pause button on big ticket non-essential purchases. The domestic economy is not uh, in a good position for the consumers to splurge. Um, the government can certainly do a lot of things, but they cannot force people to cheer up and spend. As we saw with record travel and box office numbers through the February Lunar New Year holiday, many of today's young adults, faced with diminishing job prospects and slimming wallets, are choosing leisure over luxury. During pandemic, people realize how close you can be uh, leaving this world for the paradise. And then at that moment, it probably doesn't matter that much how many material goods you have, how many houses you have, how many cars you have, but rather uh, your experiences. It's a new phenomenon for sure for newlyweds, previously accustomed to having at very least a new home by the time they marry. Yeah, we've been planning to get married, and getting married means we have to be prepared for property and raising kids. We need to be more prudent. We just got married, and I'm very hopeful for the future married life. I hope we can go through the hardship together. It should be share our happiness. Can't be just hardship. Yes, enjoy our blessings together. After decades of runaway growth, there is a palpable sense of unease in Beijing. And while piano, home, and other big-ticket item sales are slowing amid less than reassuring policy, there's still the somewhat universal need just to be heard. Stephen Engel, Bloomberg News, Beijing. All right, plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. It is a mixed picture for Asia Pac index uh, as we await that CPI print out of the U.S., which may dictate uh, the Fed's monetary easing policy. The Hang Seng up about 1.3 percent, reversing losses that we saw in the past few days. Cosby in positive territory, up about half a percent right now. Of course, we're keeping an eye on the CPI print uh, to uh, ascertain whether or not the Fed might move earlier than anticipated. In terms of some of the movers, uh, we're watching. Uh, uh, Han Hai in particular jumping as much as five and a half percent in Taipei after local media DigiTimes reported that Hewlett Packard Enterprises will turn to Han Hai as long term partner for a major order of AI service. Getting a lift as well, uh, SMIC right now currently up by two tenths of one percent. We're keeping an eye on Xiaomi as well, uh, gaining after announcing uh, its NEV launch. Xiaomi currently trading almost up percent higher on the day. In the broader market, here is how it's looking. Mixed picture, CPI front and center. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Shanghai, Shanghai, welcome back. China markets just heading to lunch. CSI 300 index in, well, slightly in the negative, down about a tenth of 1%. Like lost, uh, tapid, however you describe it, it is on renewed concerns of Ivanka. Ivanka downgraded by Moody's to uh, junk. Just when you thought that the worst might be over for China's property sector, here we are again, worrying about it. CSI 300 index flat. We have uh, the yuan trading at 7.17. 78. Bear 
in mind, though, CSI 300 index is up about 13 percent since its February low sentiment has uh, recovered somewhat. In fact, foreign investors have begun to dip their toes into uh, the market, but not enough. Today, it ain't happening. CSI 300 index tilting in the negative territory. Now, markets in Japan back from lunch. Bloomberg's Avril Hong is in the Lion City with me. What's up? Uh, what's up? Not the Nikkei, I have to say, because <laughs> of those BOJ expectations. I mean, we saw traders pairing some of the bets that we're going to see a move from the central bank next week. Uh, and this was prompted by the Governor Ueda's comments that he sees weakness in consumption in non-durable goods. Uh, but if you think about it, it's kind of hard to fight this chorus of local media reports that the BOJ is really considering very seriously a move this month, including the latest from Gigi and how they see faster wage growth potentially prompting the BOJ to exit negative rate policy. Uh, so the Nikkei is starting the afternoon session still, uh, pairing some of the declines of as much as 1.4% early on in the session. This was, of course, uh, after the comments from Ueda, but still that uh, strength in the Japanese yen, I think, is flowing through and putting that pressure on equities. Let's flip the board and take a look at what we're seeing across assets. I think among JGBs, that's when you see the reticence that we are going to see potentially that move from the BOJ as the yield on the 10-year uh, still hovering at the highest level since November last year. And across assets, uh, we're seeing those losses, as I say, bleeding through in equities. Remember, steep, steep losses on both the Nikkei and topics yesterday, and it was interesting to see how BOJ didn't step in with ETF buying. Haas, take us through the biggest losers today, Avril. Yeah, not many winners to speak of, so let's take a look at what we're seeing among the decliners. We've talked about Toyota so much amid the yen strength. That is another drag on the topics today. But it's really interesting to see how Japanese lenders are also losing ground. You would think in theory with profitability and rate hikes potentially improving, their stock should be on, you know, showing some upside. But even the biggest lender is extending declines today. The other theme that we're seeing coming through from commodities and still making related stocks. Mitsui, Marubeni, those are the ones that are dragging the Nikkei today. We saw how iron ore contracts in Singapore performed yesterday, steepest decline since 2022. It's really the China demand that's coming through. But as I say, for assets in Japan, it's really very much about what we're going to see from the BOJ next week. That's right. And the week again, not helping exporters at all. Avril Hong, thank you so much for that. Well, let's take a closer look at the yen. Japanese assets bring in MY strategist Mark Cranfield. And Mark, it's quite telling yesterday when the topic slumped more than 2%, BOJ did nothing. Mm. Traditionally, it's always jumped in, bought ETFs when we, we, we see losses of about 2%. Well, one of the interesting things is since Mr. Ueda became the governor, he made it relatively clear in the early days that unconventional policy is not something that he really agrees with. He's been very subtle about the way he's addressed it. But you can see that he doesn't particularly like yield curve control and he doesn't like the idea of buying ETFs indefinitely. So quite possible this is a signal to people to get ready for that to change as well as the, the changes from negative rates. It's possible we're now thinking about two steps here and that's partly why you're seeing even the banks declining in the equity market today because people are now getting used to the idea that March is not just a live meeting but it now looks as though something will be delivered in March when for some time we only thought it would be April or July so now we're having to retrace a bit. What could happen here is that at the March meeting, they announce no more yield curve control and they're never going to buy ETFs again, or at least until so there's a big crash in the market again. That could be delivered first and then the actual policy changes come later in April or July. That's what the market now is getting nervous about. Something is going to happen in March. So March is live. What would it take for the BOJ to make that exit in March? Probably the only missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle is the big wage hikes. We've got the Renko one, which is likely to be announced on Friday. They're going for something close to 7% in terms of wage increases, which is way above the inflation number. Bank of Japan has been insisting for a long time we need to see wage increases consistently above inflation. Well, 7%, no doubt would be way above it. So that would satisfy the Bank of Japan. That could be the missing piece. Maybe that even pushes them over the line for March. But don't forget, fiscal year end comes in between that meeting and the April meeting. That is probably the biggest caveat for not doing too much, just in case it upsets everyone's 
end of year. You know what? How much has been priced in? Because you've got to wonder the impact of the end of negative rates on the markets. Actually, not that much, really, <laughs> if you look at where, where we are. Look at 10-year Japanese yields, for example. Actually, they were higher in November last year. They almost got to 1%. Then the Bank of Japan stepped in to support the market. Look at where dollar yen is. We're trading on a 147 handle. We've actually been down, even in, over the past 18 months or so, we've been way below that. We've been down towards the, the 130 level. So in terms of where we've been in recent history, Japanese markets are not pricing in, in a great deal. And of course, in the meantime, Japanese equities have gone through the roof. So in terms of, especially if you look at the yen, if if they indicated that this is going to be a series of tightenings, that maybe they've got a plan to take short-term rates up to 0.5 or even 1%, dollar yen would have a lot of downside. But that's probably not the case. It's going to be a gentle progress. But there's certainly room for the yen to move more and for yields to go higher. But the question is really whether we're about to see yen reversal. We spoke to Omar Slim of Pine Bridge. He says, forget about it. Yes, we saw a 2% upswing last week, but you know, no yen reversal. There are still a lot of uh, positions in the market. You can see we have this weekly CFTC data, which is a good indicator of what the market is doing. The net short positions are still very high. They're running at levels we haven't seen for a couple of years. So there are plenty of people in the market who haven't given up on this carry trade where they've been shorting the yen against a variety of currencies, not just the dollar, but the euro as well. There's still a lot of that to be unwound. Maybe they also are taking a cautious approach and saying, well, we don't really believe it. Bank, we've heard so much from the Bank of Japan. When are they actually going to pull the trigger? And that's maybe why traders are holding on to some of these positions. You've got to imagine that Oweda is also keeping a close eye on Powell. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he, it would help his cause a lot if there was some coordination between the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan. If they went simultaneously, that would help him a lot. That's not going to happen. He, he's going to have to... He's going to have to bite the bullet and go first, uh, which is probably, again, why they're being extra cautious. The idea of the Bank of Japan leading the Federal Reserve is probably not ideal, but that's probably what's going to happen. Mark, before we let you go, talk to us about the BOJ survey. I mean, what are some of the takeaways from that? Uh, again, it's, it's a bit of a, a mixed picture, and economists have been burnt so many times they're probably reluctant to stick their neck out too far. But you can see a few of them are going for March now, which is, a, again, a change. It was, very clear before, people were looking for something much later in the year. Finally, the Bank of Japan, the messaging, as, as Avril was saying earlier, this constant flow in the media finally seems to convince the few economists we could get an early move. And what would be a great bet in terms of trade as we await the move from the BOJ? I think people will go more for the crosses in the yen. It's not just the dollar. There's a lot of position against the euro, the Aussie, the pound. There's plenty of room for people to play with the, with the cross rates in the, in the yen. And you're probably going to see more caution in the equity market as well. Again, because 31st of March is approaching, people who have made a lot of money on Japanese equities probably think, let's go to the sidelines for a couple of weeks. There's nothing to, to lose here, just in case the BOJ does a big surprise. And it has done that many times before. MLive strategist Mark Cranfield, we thank you so much for your insights. Now, still to come, we look ahead to India's inflation print with the Union Bank of India and why they don't see it affecting the RBI's rate decision. More on the outlook next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. Well, India starts trading in about five minutes from here, and futures pointing to a pretty flat open trepidation, as we've seen for the rest of Asia as well as we await that crucial CPI print. A Nifty futures is currently up by about a tenth of 1%, four and a half minutes to India's trading day. Meantime, India's markets regulator says it's open to revising rules for mutual funds. Investing in small cap stocks has come, says regulators have also grown wary of some parts of the economy and markets showing signs of overheating following a rally in Indian equities. Our Asia equities reporter Ashutosh Joshi joins us from Mumbai. Ashutosh, how worried are regulators about an overheated market? We've heard from SEBI, we've heard from RBI saying as much. Yeah, hi. Uh, we can surely see that uh, regulators in India 
are uh, leaving no stone unturned when it comes to markets or at least some parts of the markets getting overheated. Uh, we have seen coordinated actions from the banking regulator I RBI as well as the markets regulator SEBI uh, in this regard. Uh, it started uh, with action against a big fintech firms such as Paytm, then shadow lenders, uh, then some warnings to uh, mutual funds that manage small cap stocks. And yesterday's interaction, uh, SEBI chief uh, spoke about one more area. Uh, which is uh, India's exclusive platform for tiny IPOs where uh, the word was used as patterns of manipulations are being observed. Uh, it, it, it signals that the regulators are uh, trying to stop any potential uh, overheating of uh, the system uh, on the banking side as well as from the equity market side. Uh, the latest rules uh, also, um, the SEBI and the AMFI, which is the mutual fund industry body, has asked uh, small cap mutual fund managers to ensure that uh, their funds have enough liquidity. Um, the regulator has also asked funds uh, to conduct a stress test sort of scenario uh, checks and, and the results of which are to be made public. Uh, these actions point out at any uh, avoiding any potential uh, crash or s correction, sharp correction sort of scenario uh, to be uh, witnessed uh, in markets. So what have we seen so far? Any evidence whatsoever that these actions could lead to a correction? Yeah, uh, we haven't really seen any uh, warnings or any signs of correction sort of scenario, but but there are uh, certain areas where where regulators are worried. Uh, as I mentioned, the tiny IPOs and the small cap uh, stocks. Uh, um, the BSE's measure of a small cap index uh, is now down 5% from its peak. Uh, despite uh, these building worries, however, we have continued to see strong inflows entering small and mid cap stocks uh, in february it was 36 consecutive month of net inflows coming into uh, stocks dedicated mutual funds in india uh, through the recurring monthly investment plans uh, the funds are receiving more than dollar 2 billion of fresh money every month uh, to deploy uh, these funds into stocks uh, which are um, trading at a high valuation and also have less liquidity is a challenge for money managers. And as a result, we are seeing uh, some fund managers are avoiding uh, to take fresh infusing, uh, fresh investments into their funds, as well as limiting such investments at a, a specific amount. Ashutosh, thank you so much for that. Our Asia Agritis reporter, Ashutosh Joshi in Mumbai. Well, for more on India's growing regulatory market scrutiny, joining us from Mumbai is Kanika Pashricha, Chief Economic Advisor at Union Bank of India. Thank you for joining us. What do you make of the clampdowns so far? Are they justified? Uh, especially when you take a look at the fundamentals in the economy, in the market. So, you know, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for having me on air. And uh, I'll also uh, reassert that these are the views of Union Bank's uh, research and banking team and not of essentially of the senior management here. But if you actually look at the sequence of steps, starting from um, RBI's measures in terms of uh, steps to curb credit excesses for NBFCs, HFCs, and unsecured retail lending, and now the next step coming in from SEBI as a regulator, it seems that regulators in India, as we are facing a virtuous growth cycle, are trying to take preemptive steps in order to curb the credit excesses wherever they can, um, as a SEBI chairperson also commented, to restrict the bubble of uh, or froth in the system in order to ensure a sustainable growth cycle this time around. If you remember last time, 10 years ago, when we had the credit cycle at its peak, but after that, there was a swing of NPAs coming in. There was down cycle witnessed in terms of credit in the economy. It's only in recent years, the up cycle has reinitiated and they want it to be sustainable this time around. That's how we see this. You, you talk about taking preemptive steps. 
are there reasons to be worried already? Is there no sign of hot money in India? So how we see it actually, um, so this is not hot money coming into India. This is more about in a boom cycle, there will always be segments which will see fund flow, but they might turn out to be high risk segments or not uh, highly credit rated segments, which is what the regulators are trying to curb. Because if you see, you know, the money that's coming into small caps, mid caps, or when you're talking about credit lending from banks to say NBFCs, et cetera, sees on unsecured retail lending, this is not about hot money. It's more about in a virtuous growth cycle, you are likely to see money flow into these uh, high credit risk segments. And that for that, the preemptive measures are being taken up. This is not hot money. This is just fund flow, which is there adequately, even domestically, flowing into high risk segment as part of the virtuous growth cycle. Kalika, taking a look at India's economy, we have CPI print coming out for February. You're expecting 5.1%, which is ways off from that 4% target. How do you see uh, India's CPI playing out? So frankly, 5.1, just on a short-term basis, is same as similar to the print seen in January. And uh, the prime reason why we are looking at a static print is that food prices especially vegetables, are lagging the seasonal correction. However, the underlying details also show that they mean there are likely to be marginal correction further lower, further below 4% mark to around, uh, you know, 3.5% in core inflation, which we've already seen in the past few months. We see core CPI sustaining at 3.5% and core X transport, because in India and core inflation, petrol and diesel prices are included, that is likely to ease a bit further below the 4% mark to 3.7, 3.9 uh, in January. So core stays below 4%. Food prices lagging seasonal correction, especially vegetables, keeping CPI elevated at close to 5, 5.1% mark. In the coming quarters, as the NPC also expects uh, July to September, uh, with base effects, and with correction in food prices, assuming a normal monsoon and commodity prices staying well with well behaved, we are likely to see uh, overall headline inflation move towards the 4% handle in the coming quarters, uh, especially by Q2 FI25, July to September. So, overall, right, so 4% mark remains in sight. So, risk. So uh, what do you maybe. see what do you see the RBI doing this year? Might it be able to cut this year or wait till 2025? So two points, and I'll actually you know get back to the first point you made uh, about uh, the regulators taking preemptive measures uh, to curb credit excesses and to ensure a sustainable growth trajectory. Just looking at that, it seems that monetary policy easing will also be is they are not likely to introduce, or they are actually wary of any premature monetary policy easing as well. So rate cuts happen, or any sort of policy easing happens later rather than sooner in our view. Of course, inflation is the main target that the MPC is looking at. Uh, if inflation settles at 4.5% 4, 4 in the next financial year, which is as per MPC's forecast, 200 basis points real rate, so scope for at least a 50 basis point uh, shallow rate cut cycle does open up. But still, the timing for the same, in our view, is likely to be uh, later rather than sooner, not before August. And the bias still remains of rate cuts only happen in H2 FI25, October to March um, FI25. In terms of growth, India is going gangbusters. In fact, the Indian government raised its forecast. We had the RBI saying 8% is possible. Is that a sustainable pace of growth for India? So actually, if you see, well, looking at the numbers for the last three years, post the data revisions, the average growth, not just for the, last, the current financial year, which is about to end in March, FI24, an average pace of growth for 22 and 23 combined also looks around 8, 8.5%. 8 
So last three years, we've already averaged 8%. But looking at a sustainable medium-term growth numbers, um, as of now, still looks closer to, uh, you know, closer to 7% mark. In fact, for FI25, our forecast is close to 7% because uh, there is likely to be global growth slowdown, some soft landing there, delayed impact of uh, rate hikes in India as well. And of course, uh, you know, when we see, when we talk about uh, impact of fiscal consolidation, because a key driver of this growth cycle has been capex and not consumption, and that too capex led by the government. As we see fiscal consolidation, with private capex expected to be delayed to H2, uh, some slowdown in growth momentum likely right. towards 7%, which looks sustainable. Right. Kanika, thank you so much for that. Kanika Pashrika, Chief Economic Advisor at Union Bank of India. And uh, we have uh, some he headlines to tell you about. Uh, according to the AFP, citing Guyana President, uh, the Haiti Prime Minister Ariel Henry has resigned. Uh, that's according to AFP. And citing President of Guyana, uh, the Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry has resigned. We know that uh, Haiti has struggled with lawlessness and uh, the government has declared a state of emergency after arms gangs raided the country's two biggest jails and freed thousands of prisoners. We'll bring you the very latest. And for now, though, let's do a check on Indian markets. been trading for about seven minutes now. Let's take a look at where the benchmarks are at this point in time. Mixed picture for India's so Sensex up about a tenth of one percent. And Nifty also in positive positive territory, but uh, banks are a drag currently down about a tenth of 1%. And the rupee 82.74 versus the USD pretty flat at this point in time. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. It is about that CPI print out of the U.S., which may dictate how the Fed goes forward with its rate cuts. But in terms of movers, we're tracking uh, steel-related stocks uh, on the back of how iron ore has slumped. I uh, remember that uh, iron ore slumped as 7% in what was its deepest plunge since 2022. Disappointment after that MPC uh, meeting failed to revive demand uh, expectations. Also, inventories in China piling up, and we're seeing iron ore currently extending that that decline by more than 3% right now. Uh, those related stocks, South 32, Fortescue Metals, as well as Angang Steel, also in negative territory. We're keeping an eye on Chinese uh, property sector as well. China Vanka currently up by about 3%, despite Moody's cutting it to junk. Uh, China property crisis back in focus for investors. Poly Real Estate currently up by 2% as well. China Overseas Land in positive territory. That is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia. Daybreak Middle East and Africa is next. Do keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.